Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. Let me just give you a short introduction of what we're trying to do today. I've been working in this field, I guess, more than 50 years now. And many of the pioneers are at my stage too. And we're able to have a perspective. And the perspective is more of a conceptual one. And what stimulated the webinar today is that lately I've been thinking about what I do through a different lens. And I want to offer you that lens because it changes the way you do therapy. The background is, is that when I started this work, the idea was that a lot of people were going to psychiatric hospitals and they had a history of rape and sexual abuse, but nobody was treating the rape and sexual abuse. And when I pointed out the elephant in the living room, people would say that these are borderline patients and they're going to become psychotic if you begin to work with the trauma. And if you're newer in the field, you may not really appreciate how drastic this was. For example, I opened up a, a trauma program in New Orleans with Dr. Masters of Masters and Johnson, and no psychiatrist in the city would work with us because they said we were going to make borderline patients uh, psychotic. And my idea was to show that we could treat the trauma and they would get remarkably better and they wouldn't be borderline anymore. So the first thing I did was I used the Gundersen measure of borderline personality disorder and showed that they were no longer borderline after we treated the trauma. Anyway, that was sort of revolutionary. And so I became what would be called a trauma therapist. What we found out was that was necessary, but not sufficient. And so I began to move more towards treating attachment disorders. And I've lectured on that prior to that. And I thought, well, now this is both necessary and sufficient. But recently, what I've decided was that treating the trauma, treating the attachment disorder, Neither of those are sufficient. And so today I want to try to introduce a different lens. And it, a lot of you will say, well, I already know that. But knowing it then will open up the doors to a different focus in treatment. And that's what I want to convince you of today. The idea was that, you know, most people want to treat the symptom. A person comes in with chemical dependency, let's treat. The addiction, put them in a 12-step meeting, get them sober, and we'll call that treatment success. And I think that's just bullshit. I think that that's the first step of treatment, but that's not treatment success. It's treating the symptom. And so what I like to do is I always ask, what's the problem underneath the symptom? Because you know, you have the leave and then you have the root, and the leave is the symptom, the root is what's underneath that in some way. And so, yes. Not only do I want to treat the symptom, but now we have to look at creating a life worth living, to use Marshall Linehan's term. And let's look at their chaotic directionist lifestyle. And cognitive behavioral therapies, you know, are heavily oriented towards teaching skills and so on. And I've been there, done that. And I don't think it works. So moving on. I had this idea that if we treated the trauma, the PTSD at first, and then as complex trauma got more well-known, the complex trauma, that that would be the missing piece. And so I got really good at treating PTSD, EMDR, internal family systems, um, somatic therapies, affect accelerated psychotherapies, hypnosis, uh, exposure therapies. I was trained in all of them and uh, worked with clients on each of those methodologies and did some good work. And now what I want to introduce today is that I think that is fraught with difficulty too. So I think a lot of the senior people in the field are recognizing that we need to get out of the trauma concept in the PTSD concept of think, well, I've got to work on the event 
and now ask why that event is so difficult. I've always wondered why, for example, sexual abuse in particular, um, the pernicious elements of that, where so many people have a hard time even recovering from that as a PTSD. And I think it's what's embedded in it. And so what I'm saying is, is that what we need to be looking at are now being thought of as adversities or what Dick Schwartz calls burdens. And what I mean by that is that I think a lot of people don't realize that they're carrying burdens from their childhood that are not related to PTSD or complex trauma, but just sort of a very strong message that they received. For example, I had a client this week and she said, um, I, uh, during the, ep the epidemic uh, that has been going on for the last two years, um, I kept my daughter in the house and wouldn't let her out. And uh, that in some way hurt her. And I asked why she did that. And she said, I'm afraid that she's going to die and it's going to be my fault. Now, where did that come from? That her obsession was, my children are going to die and it's going to be my fault. And everything she did was around that obsession. And where did that come from? And I see a person approaching with that symptom as that's the window that I have to go in and figure out where that unusual belief came from that's controlling so much of what she thinks and feels and does on a day-by-day -day basis. So my original training was hypnosis and there was what was called the affect bridge. And you would follow that, the affect that's so tied into, I'm afraid my children are gonna die. And you see where it leads. And it first oftentimes will lead to a, a PTSD event. Like for her, it was her mother's death that was, the PTSD event. But if you keep following that affect bridge, it's what was called in the EMDR literature that there were channels of trauma and that you emptied one channel out and there'd be another channel underneath that. And that came from Francine Shapiro. And so that rarely was emptying one channel gonna be enough. If I follow the adversity or burden, it's gonna lead me in that way. And now I'll just, as part of the introduction, tell you where I'm gonna to head today. I believe that it will always lead to a problem of a disorder of self and affect regulation. And so the real problem that addicts have is that they're feeling like they're imposters. They feel hollow inside. They feel depersonalization. They don't know who they are and they have a disorder of self. And so, the idea then is that um, we have to begin to understand how to treat disorders of self. And so where that's led me, and this is gonna be a preview of coming events, is I think our whole field is becoming more psychodynamic and object relations. And that we're heading back to Winnicott, Fairborn, um, and Kohut, and even Freud, and uh, but in a more empirical way. So, Let's see if I can show you how I got to that conclusion. This is from Dick Schwartz. Those of you who don't know, Dick and I are buddies and he was in residence with me for a year. You know, I love the guy. And he says that this quote, he says, Sally's father hated weakness inside him and outside him. He was dominated by stoic critical parts and was ashamed of his own hurt parts, his own parts of self. When Sally was a child, every time she was sad or cried, her father became agitated and impatient. As a result, Sally tried to keep that sad part out of her life. Stoic critical parts that disdain weakness came to dominate her life in the same way they dominated her father. In this way, he passed on to her the legacy burden of stoicism. Now, I read that you know, 10 years ago and I got it. But what I'm saying today is I don't think I really got it. Dick called that a burden. And what he wanted to do was unburden Sally so that that um, brainwashing 
did not control everything she thought, felt, did on a day-by-day -day basis. And so a lot of my focus now is not on the trauma, but on looking at these burdens that people carry and these, um, uh, how they influence it. It also reminds me of Pat Resick. And, you know, I, I was lucky enough to be in St. Louis when she was there. And she had cognitive reprocessing therapy. And what she kept saying is that it's the belief systems that are embedded in trauma that need to be looked at. And state dependent learning is very susceptible to change if you begin to focus on what the core beliefs get brainwashed in as a result of the trauma. So it's not the trauma per se, but the cognitions and the beliefs that are embedded in it. And these cognitions, these are the kinds of things that I'm calling um, adversities. And so probably a better term is we need to work with clients' adversities and that all of us have these. And they're oftentimes intergenerational. The quote here just says, we need more understanding of the intergenerational transmission of trauma. And a child who herself did not suffer sexual abuse, for example, but is nonetheless subjected to her mother's overly promiscuous attitudes or overly strict attitudes about dating, will inhabit many shades of her mother's fears, emotional reactions to men, and defensive adaptations. Now, you know, for many years I was a sex therapist primarily, and people would come in with inhibited sexual desire, inhibited sexual arousal, or sexual addiction and sexual compulsivity. And so many people wanted to jump to, you know, were you sexually abused? And most of us realize that sexualized children or people who have the opposite, which is really over uh, inhibited uh, sexual information um, are the ones that are most likely to have sexual problems. It's been estimated that one out of three women really don't enjoy sex with their husbands. And these data are fairly reliable. And so we have an epidemic of problems, not because of just sexual abuse, which is rampant, but much more about what we're talking about in this. And so it's that residue of dealing with the adversities that we had to work on in therapy. But too many people were led to the PTSD piece of it, thinking, well, this must be due to trauma rather than to adversity. And so Today, I want to talk about how you treat adversity as opposed to treating trauma. Now, this is still a way of introductions. I take this from a book by Guidina and Leotti called Complexity of the Self. And Leotti is sort of one of my great heroes out of Italy. Um, and I love this book because, uh, and we'll give you a reference for it later, that we're, we're looking at all the symptoms of, in psychiatry and the burdens that they carry. So for example, why are you depressed? Well, it's not just the trauma, it's the, I didn't have control over the trauma that seems to be the relevant variable. Or I feel defective as a human being as a result of the trauma. So we have to look at the adversity that's underneath the trauma that causes the symptom or a phobia. I can't, you know, I can't avoid a feared stimulus. So I become phobic and it becomes overgeneralized, OCD, uh, rituals to control consequences um, is the adversity, eating disorder, um, perfectionism, anticipation of failure, having to be perfect. And so as whatever symptom we're talking about, you know, you get these books on how do you treat OCD through exposure therapy, or how you treat eating disorder. And I swear, as I read those books, they're missing the core element, which is this, that, um, that in order to treat these syndromes, you have to understand the personality disorder that's underneath it in some way. One of the great writers in, in the field of eating disorder said, you know, eating disorder is an axis one and an axis two disorder. And the axis two disorder is that there's a per personality disorder that's underneath it that we're not really adequately treating because you can treat the symptom, the person actually starts eating or stops binging, but the personality disorder stays there and their life becomes miserable. And so the personality disorder that's underneath it is due to these adversities that I'm talking about. 
this will all become a little clear to you if you're a little baffled as this unfolds a little bit. For a lot of times in my career, I treated sex addiction primarily, and then I treated eating disorder primarily. Now I work with chemical dependency heavily on a day-by-day -day basis. And each of these were subspecialties that took special skills. But when I got done sort of looking at all this through the, my own age and time, what I realized is that so many of these addictions were more similar than they are different. And sex addiction is not primarily about sex. And eating disorder is not primarily about food. Um, what are they about? Because, you know, the, the people who are experts in the field focus on sex, they focus on food. And, you know, I want to scream to them and say, it's about the food, but it's not about the food. And what I mean by that is the obvious, which is the shame, the fear, the helplessness that is embedded in it, loss of control, and that it's idiosyncratic to the biography of the individual. And if you trace the symptom back, it will always lead you to what happened. Like, for example, one of my clients was, he was having sex um, outside of his marriage with prostitutes and the prostitutes would beat him. And it's like, okay, you're having affairs, you have affairs with prostitutes and you have them whip you and beat you. And this guy was a prosecuting attorney in the, in the state. I thought, oh boy. And so, you know, I could send him to a 12-step program. I could get him under control of the sex addiction that way. And, you know, feel happily ever after. But, you know, the probability of relapse was almost assured. And so when I just focused on the sex addiction and we followed the affect back, um, he was looking through a keyhole and his mother was a prostitute and he was watching her have sex with men. And I got into the primary process thinking at the time, and that was what was embedded in his mind which is sex is bad, um, men are out of control, and my mother's taken away by men. And if, you know, that sex is bad, but it's necessary. And that became what was written into his brain, sex is bad, but it's necessary. And so the symptom of being with prostitutes became, you know, a rational uh, solution. And so the managers sort of figured on that in a compulsive sort of way. But when I brought all that into his consciousness, we began to break the addiction out. Now, conceptualize that for a minute. The basically psychodynamic therapy is taking what's unconscious and bring it into consciousness and understanding that when there's trauma, oftentimes there's amnesia of the event or partially of the event. And so, you know, the key aspect is beginning to bring this in. Now, I, I'm not saying that that cures a person. But I've become now curious that that's a component of curing of the person. And what my clients tell me is that what happens in therapy is that the events that happen in the past that are big to them are not actually the ones that are related to their current symptoms. And they're always surprised to find that they'll remember something that happened that was a lot less traumatic to them that is primarily what's in control of the current symptoms. I call that a trauma bond, meaning that something from the present is controlled by something from the past. But the event in the past is not what they thought it was, or even what I thought it was. It was something that happened, you know, on April 2nd, you know, 20 years ago that they didn't realize was still controlling. I can give you a lot of examples of that, but you get my point. Number seven, um, that the the error that I think we've made as therapists is we're too focused on the external, meaning the eating disorder, the food, or the sexual addiction, the sex, and that those symptoms are actually a solution. And I call those distress-reducing behaviors, or DRBs, and that people use DRBs to escape pain or aversity. And so what we're trying to be able to do is begin not just to take the DRB away, but understand it as functional and a way of dealing with something much bigger that's going on inside. 
Now, what is it that's going on inside that the DRB is taking care of? And the answer to that is that the DRB is, and you just ask any client and they'll tell you this, is I feel like I'm in pain and I need to escape the pain. I feel empty and I'll do anything to feel connected. Um, Boba used to talk about protest, despair, and apathy. And there's nothing more uncomfortable than feeling apathy. And so you'll do anything to escape that apathy and that emptiness inside. And so what we need to be dealing with is it's an inside job, not an outside job. And what is going on inside? And I swear to you, if I ask 10 clinicians how you treat disorders of self, they'll all tell you something different. I pull up Masterson's book, Disorders of Self. I pull up Winnicott's book on, in, on disorders of self. I pull up Fairbank on disorders of self. And I reread all this classic literature. And then my very favorite, I'm going to bring up um, Fonagy, uh, Affect Regulation, Mentalization, and Development of Self. Now, clearly, all these smart people recognize what I'm just saying to you is obvious, which is that we're talking about disorders of self. And yet, as I read every one of those books, um, and I do, I reread them all the time, I recognize that how you treat in a cookbook way a disorder of self is still a bit of an, a, a confusing aspect. And I doubt if many beginning clinicians have a course on treating disorders of self, although they should. So what I'm going to be talking about today is an inside job. And what is a disorder of self and what to do about it. And hopefully I'll say a few things new. Okay, one last thing, which is the lens that I always look through is the lens of dissociation. And not that many people have had that fortune, but in my own um, growth, I opened up a dissociative disorders unit in one of my incarnations. And in that dissociative disorders unit, um, I became uh, wise to begin to notice that the dissociative feature of all people is on a continuum and it's only a matter of degree. And so what happens is that when there, a child has perceived danger in an evolutionary way in order to survive, parts of self become split off. So the basic psychodynamic model is disown parts of self, reowning them. And of course, that's the core of all good psychotherapy. But these sensory, emotional, and cognitive processes that are locked away and are lack integration. So Dan Siegel talks about the goal of therapy is integrating just own parts of self. And the new literature coming out on brain is how these lack of integration are literally occurring in the brain pathways. And so when a child has events that are just overwhelming, they stay uh, in the deep structures of the brain and many times are not even metabolized through the hippocampus into long-term memory. And so, so many of these events are either unconscious or pre-conscious. And I think that leads us back to psychodynamics because we're still trying to take these events that are disowned and begin to bring them back into the conscious mind and that they're not consolidated into the hippocampus. Um, and so you were beginning to conceptualize the neuroanatomy of what must happen in psychotherapy, which is the hippocampus grabs it and allows the person to metabolize that. And the only way to be able to do that is through the emotional system. And so, so much of what we're doing is affect-based therapy rather than cognitive behavioral therapy. And bringing these memories that are unconscious or pre-conscious into consciousness and making sense of them. Now, what I'm saying is these memories are adversities and they're burdens. And oftentimes the person's totally unaware of them and will never present them to the therapist. And so why am I depressed? Um, and the person gives their story, embedded in the story is not going to be the adversity. And so the real challenge of psychotherapy is to find out which events, which burdens, which adversities have shaped what's now resulting in the dysfunctional 
disordered behavior. And so in a dissociative perspective, oftentimes they're embedded in parts. And you only discover this as you work with the parts. So as an example of that, I saw a client yesterday and um, sometimes she was extremely irritable and angry. And it might've been bipolar because she certainly has to have that diagnosis. Um, but when you asked her, she'd say, I'm very compliant and I don't feel like I'm angry. And so, you know, I just simply, because I've been working with dissociative clients for so long, I just access the part of self that's angry by taking the last time she had an out of control episode, bring it into our office. And I, as I begin to revivify that, reactivate it in my office, I follow that irritability and angry back. And the part just comes into my office that's filled with rage and anger. And, you know, she's about 16 years old. And, you know, she has lots of beliefs of a 16 year old that are currently not true in the present. And so she knows things at one level, but feels things at another level. And so when she tries to explain that, it feels very overwhelming and confused. And that's the dissociative barriers. And so for most of us, who've had that background of dissociation, sometimes the only way to get to these adversities is to understand the dissociative nature of it. I'll say more about that as we go along. Now, I've talked about PTSD, I've talked about complex trauma, I've talked about adversities. Now I wanna hit, talk about dissociation. Now I wanna talk the fifth component of this, which is attachment theory. In attachment therapy, we have what are basically organized state and disorganized state. The organized state, which most of us have, is that we're either preoccupied and have anxious attachment or we're avoidant and have avoidant attachment. And you all know about that. Or if you haven't, you've seen that in my previous seminars or you can read about it. My primary focus is the disorganized state because um, what Fonagy has showed us is that most psychiatric patients have disorganized attachment. And so about 10 years ago, I took a training with Mary Main's folks on how to score the adult attachment. Review. And uh, it was really rigorous, like 10 hours a day for two weeks. It was one of the hardest things I ever learned how to do, but it changed the lens by which I did therapy afterwards because I began to see my patients through the lens of disorganized attachment and disorganized states. Now, the key aspect of disorganized state is that you have polarized internal and external representations of self and others. So I feel stu like I'm stupid, even though I know I'm smart. I feel like I'm bad, even though I know I'm good. And it seems confusing because these disorganized states there are inconsistencies that result at the same time. And it's these disorganized states that cause people tremendous dysfunction in their behavior. And that there have affect storms because of affect dysregulation uh, and that they regulate themselves by regulating others, which you, know, the, you see that with disorganized children, that the only way they can regulate themselves is by either becoming codependent and serving their masters or being incredibly controlling and uh, or attempt to be uh, a, a very uh, acting out in an oppositional defiant way. So the two strategies of the disorganized child is over control or becoming extremely compliant. And those then become the personality styles that become relatively permanent as they begin to reach adulthood and get in so much trouble when it comes to committed relationships. And so, so many of the clients who we've defined as borderline seem to be okay until they get into a relationship. And um, it's because that they're of this disorganized state. And it's because we as therapists have not defined our job as helping a person who's disorganized become earn secure. And I learned how to treat earn secure by taking this training. And I'm gonna to try to teach you what I learned from Mary Main's folks, if you just can stay with me for the next hour.
So just a, a background that um, the idea of disorganized detachment is there are contradictory affects. I feel stupid and I know I'm smart. I feel bad even though I know I'm good. And you know the client comes in and says, I hate myself. And then you say, oh, why do you hate yourself? You're such a wonderful, terrific human being. And what you're saying just is so confusing because they know what you're telling them and yet they don't feel it. And so how do you take these inconsistencies and do anything about it? And the problem is, is there's no coherent organization. And the word coherent is a magical term because what it means to me is, is that two and two always equals four. And the reason the way they think and feel are divergent makes perfect rational sense. And so what I have to do is uncover the disorganized state. And so what we're doing is that when you feel one way and think another way, your core sense of self is totally disorganized. And so in these disorders of self that we're talking about, what was missing was attachment theory. And um, for so many of them, you know, these early people, you know, now as they've become more contemporary, um, they've added attachment theory and some of the more contemporary books, you know, include that piece in it. And that's what we'll be referring to today. And so the idea then is they regulate themselves by regulating others. And uh, addiction, you know, the primary addiction is codependency. And all other addictions are subordinate of codependency. And why do I say that? Because either you're going to control yourself by controlling others, or you're going to control yourself by being compliant with others. And it's all about control. And so if you get the person to stop using the, um, the behavior that they're using to escape from their own uh, misery uh, and get their, uh, basically their, uh, their behavior that they're running away from under control, then what we're saying then is that uh, what they're left with is codependency, which is they're using people externally to create, to basically control their internal states. And so I always want to treat codependency as a primary addiction with all addicts and not just focus on the rats. Now, in the attachment theory, the child's psychological survivor must not depend on meeting the mother's needs. So the child regulates themselves by controlling the mother because that's the only way they can feel safe. Uh, and he or she becomes at the request of other, that's codependency. And when that happens, the true self goes down below and you become somebody whose primary orientation is other and otherization. The eating disorder client has practically no self and is almost totally oriented towards others. And so I can't have needs, needs are bad, and the way I cannot have needs is not to even have appetite. And so the true self goes under. So in treating eating disorder, yes, you can get them to eat the food. Yes, you can stop them from binging. But can you begin to see the development of the real self? And it's only then that the eating disorder goes into remission. And I doubt if you read any eating disorder books who will even give you a chapter on that. The false self provides an illustration of personal existence it's fashioned out of the maternal expectation. And so, you know, basically we're going back to, you know, the development of how you see the development of the real self and how are we going to do that? So let's develop a cookbook of how one does that. Uh, and what I'm saying is that an eating disorder client, for example, is not uh, treated effectively unless you've laid out the map of recovery, that the first step is being able to deal with the food. The sex addict isn't treated effectively if the first step is getting under control of out of control sexual behavior, 
but they understand the map of recovery means that they begin to see the development of the real self and develop earn secure attachment. And that's the primary goal of therapy. And that's what I focus my treatment on, not just on the symptom, because I think taking the symptom away without treating the root can actually be re-victimizing to a client. So this disorganized state of mind is terrifying. The person does not trust themselves because they're so out of control. They're highly fragmented in their personality. They have contradictory beliefs and affects, and they don't have a single organized attachment strategy. And so what happens is they go in between being, you know, having tremendous uh, feelings of abandonment when someone leaves them and then pushing the other person away and driving themselves crazy with and driving their partners crazy with come closer, go away. Okay, so I, I've studied this for years and I've tried to understand more about what Bowlby called internal working models. Now, I know we all know what that means, but let's think about it for a minute. I say to my client, I would like you to begin to lay out your internal working models of how you perceive yourself, how you perceive others, and how you perceive the world around you. And what do they say? I feel like I'm bad, I hate myself, I think other people can't be trusted, and they'll screw you whenever they get a chance, uh, and they don't care really about anyone but themselves and their money, and the world around you is a cruel, scary, terrifying place. Now, I would say 95% of my clients will say that. Now, how can you possibly live your life with those as your internal working models? And so their internal working models are primarily negative. And that's the key feature of disorganized attachment, which is that a person is, their, their lens is always that negative. Now, how, how do you change people's internal working models so that they see themselves in a positive light, they see some people in a positive light, and that they see the world as potentially um, having something to offer them in some ways? Well, it turns out that that's very complex, and cognitive-based therapies are terrible at that. You know, I, I, I think we try to brainwash people to think positively, but I... Uh, you know, I, I think that's necessary, but really sufficient. And so how do we get that positive lens? Sometimes, you know, we build a therapeutic community, which I think is an essential component to this process. And the person will get feedback in a group setting, and I'll hear this wonderful feedback from others. And when I ask the client what they heard in group, what they heard was through their negative internal working model, and has no um, comparison to what I experienced being in the room. And so what they do is they take the input from their environment, their mirror, and they change it. And so um, out of that came a new kind of therapy, which was called you know, metacognitive therapy, or what Fonagy later called mentalizing or reflective function. And in it, what he began to realize is that this is so complex, these internal working models. And so at Menninger, there began to, you know, Bateman and others there wrote about mentalizing based therapies, which became an evidence based model, but it was heavily cognitive in its formation, but somewhat affective, you know, or schema therapy which you know, I thought was incredible. Uh, and I just felt like, like Jeffrey Young really got it when he understood that schema therapy is about changing internal working models. And of course, Dick Schwartz. But all of them were oriented to beginning to look at the basis of the negativity of internal working models. And then met, there are now what are called metacognitive assessment devices. And I, as you, you can Google that. And there are you know, many of them coming out of social psychology. And what we realize is that these are actually executive function disorders. And 
the person cannot decentrate, meaning that everything is seen. They think that other people think like they do. And they don't realize that other people have thoughts that are not like their thoughts. And you can just ask a person, you know, what do you think Joe is thinking right now? And they'll tell you, and what Joe is thinking is what they're thinking, but Joe is not thinking what they're thinking. And so um, what can you do to change that decentralization? Now, just having that formulation, you could see how in psychotherapy, it would be so useful to begin to say something like, you know, what do you think about what I think of you? And, you know, the, it's so interesting. Uh, I said to a client group the other day, what do you think I think of you? And she said, you think I'm, and she went through four negative characteristics. And I said, not one of the things that you said are true. Now, let me tell you what I really do think of you. And I then laid it out. And, you know, I was speaking from my heart, not from my head. And the whole group just laughed and laughed and laughed because, you know, now we're understanding the basis of transference and countertransference. And what you hope is that the person can begin to see themselves as you're reflecting, but it ain't gonna happen because of errors in mentalization. And so when I reread the mentalization, you know, I, I read it you know, years ago when it got published and I read Fonagy years ago when it got published. But now that I'm sort of seeing this through this new lens, what I'm saying to you is they got it. Man. That's really true that mentalization errors are at the really core of psychodynamic theory. You know, we forget sometimes because Fonagy is so sophisticated in his empiricism that he's basically psychoanalytic and you know, he's writing to psychoanalytic audiences and reforming psychoanalytic theory. And what we're saying then is, and here's what I'm trying to say in this lecture, which is I think we're moving back to an empirically based psychodynamic theory. I think most of us recognize that happening. Okay, so Reminding ourselves the lens of disorganized atta attachment. The first step is you do a narrative. I think most treatment programs now are having people do timelines. But in that timeline, it's not something you do once, but something you do weekly, because you're trying to be able to take events in your life and make sense of them. And what I'm saying to you is that your behavior, as crazy as it is, makes perfect sense if you understand the lens of disorganized attachment. And that's what I want you to understand as my client. And two, that you're regulating self by regulating others. And here's what your addiction is about. And three, that you have multiple self states that take over at certain times and outside your voluntary control, they pop out. And only by working with those self states can I then allow you to have integration. And it's accessing your self states, either through EMDR, through internal family systems, through affect accelerated psychotherapy, through ego states work, through hypnosis, through any affect-based therapy, by accessing those self states, can we begin to help you integrate. Okay, now, I said to you, it's an internal job, not an external. And what these cell states are is all human beings have child parts inside that are needy and clingy. And even if you have avoidant attachment. And all of us have cell states that are highly controlling, hostile, and angry. And all of us have internal safe cell states that are codependent. We want to take care of others to meet our own needs. And so by beginning to look at the internal system through that lens, you know, I try to get to know each of those three self states. And they're oftentimes quite divergent. They lack any integration. And the person's really unaware that they take executive control at certain times. So for example, the obvious. When I'm working in a group setting, I find that people are incredibly empathetic and compassionate and want to help people in the room. They're the most compassionate people in the room. And then they'll say, I feel that's true for everybody in the room but me. I know you've all heard that a thousand times. But think about that for a minute. I know that's true for everybody else but me. That's a mentalizing error. 
And your goal is to get them understand that the way they feel about others is the way they need to feel about self. And your psychotherapy has to be oriented towards making that structural change of looking at those inconsistencies. And that's dissociative, it's disorganized, and it's also the reason why they can think something and feel something quite different. Okay, so now I'm going back to Fonagy. Some of you may have never heard of this term called mentalization. Um, it's worth reading Fonagy again and again and again to figure it out. But, you know, reflective function was his scale. And I, I study that reflective function scale all the time. You know, I love Fonagy. If you ever get a chance to hear him, listen to him. But what, in reflective function, the child comes home and says, why are the kids in school so mean? And the parent sits down and gives them 100% of their attention, tries to explain why the kids in school are so mean in a way that the child can understand it. But if the parent doesn't understand it, they can't really explain it to the child. And so good psychotherapy is always about mentalization and explaining why some people are so mean and what it really means. Um, and you know that's what um, they call good old psychotherapy um, at, the, at, the, at manager. Now, formalizing that helps you understand what the client really needs. But mentalization involves both intra and interpersonal. Interpersonal is what we always do, which is between two people. But so much of the psychotherapy is intra. Mentalization is about doing an inside job and looking at one's relationship with oneself. When disorganized, the caretaker doesn't mirror these outside experiences accurately. And so the person is left incredibly confused. And so there's a lack of sense of self. I don't know who I am. A lack of sense of agency, meaning I don't feel like an operator on my world around me effectively and an inability to regulate their emotions. And so your psychotherapy is always around those three components. Now, with disorganized attachment, we come to misunderstand that we think and feel one thing while truly feeling another emotion. Now, what the hell does that mean? What it means is that when we're feeling angry at somebody, we really believe that we're angry at Joe because Joe did X. But the truth is, we are not angry at Joe because Joe did X. What we are is we're tapping into one of the adversities from our past and projecting it onto Joe in the present. Now, that sounds so confusing. I probably sound like I have disorganized attachment. But think about it for a minute. Let's say that my girlfriend breaks up with me. And let's say I feel like I want to kill myself. And if you ask me, why do you want to kill yourself? I say, Oh, because my girlfriend broke up with me. Okay. And that makes perfect sense to you, but it makes no sense to me as the therapist. Okay. And you want to say, now come on, you know, you got a whole life ahead of you. There's probably going to be another relationship behind it. You all know we have serial monogamy and most relationships last about seven years. You know, you'll get over this, you know, blah, 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 blah. And we've all been yapping about this for years. Now, it's not good therapy because we're not really hearing the problem. Why the person wants to kill themselves, not because their girlfriend broke up with them, but it's tapping into something much deeper. And the client is giving you a gift in having the symptom. By feeling suicidal over a girlfriend breaking up with you, it's your opportunity to take something that happened to them a long time ago that they didn't have the cognitive structures and maturity to deal with, and putting it on the table and telling you, this is what we need to deal with in psychotherapy, which was the abandonment that came from, you know, what happened when, you know, your brother was killed in an accident and your mother stopped feeling anything and stopped loving you. And you felt totally abandoned by your mother stopped loving you. And you decided that, you know, blah, 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 blah. 
And good psychotherapists know that's true. But what we want to be able to do is, is help the client understand that what we're really thinking and feeling in the present is not about what they think and about, but it's about another emotion. And that emotion is a tied to the unfinished business from the past. Laborski wrote a book called Core Relational Conflict. And it's such a cool book because each of us has a core relational conflict. And by bringing that core relational conflict into consciousness, Laborski said, you can change all your relationships. But the core relational conflict is dealt to these adversities in the past, not deal with what's in the present. And that's sometimes not available for the person in their conscious mind because the nature of trauma is always amnesia or disowning parts of self, which is about amnesia. So you're not going to even know that what you're feeling and thinking in the present have anything to do with anything in the past. Get it? Anyway, it's such a profound concept. Okay, so if you are thinking back here, you're saying, you know, Mark, um, you know, tell me something new. Like, I learned this from Sigmund Freud in 1901. And it's like, you know, what are you uh, hiding under a, uh, a rock? Old Sigmund said, a thing which has not been understood inevitably reappears like an unlaid ghost. It can rest until the mystery has been solved and the spell broke. Don't you just love that quote? You know? And honestly, you know, I burned all my Freud books many years ago and had to rebuy them because um, the, the truth is, is that we are, uh, nothing's ever new. We're always rediscovering what we already know, but uh, you know, it's kind of exciting for that to happen. And I'm telling you that I think our field is uh, having the same aha that I am. And that not so much Freud, but you know, the people subsequently from Freud, you know, Winnicott, Fairborn, uh, Kohut, the ego psychologist, uh, you know, lots of good stuff there. And that ought to be in all training programs these days and rarely is. Anyway, um, so um, I'm saying to you now that my job is to see the development of the real self and to move towards earned secure attachment. And you're saying, how do you do that? And I've begun to give you a hint of my approach to that, but let's try to delineate that a little bit. And um, the, if I know that the principal feature is the child, victim, the persecutory part of self and the internal self helpers, that gives me at least um, a focus of where I'm going to do the internal work. All right, so I'm now moving towards more metacognition work and understanding one's own mind, understanding others' minds, decentralization, other people don't think like you think, and mastery, the four components of metacognition. And I'm interested in allowing people to have empty models that are primarily positive rather than primarily negative. And that probably includes YouTube also, which is um, to look at how negative your internal working models. You know, I, I look at it all the time. You know, the world around me seems to be crumbling and I'm scared to death with, you know, what's going on with the Soviet Union and the economy and all those things. And it's hard to maintain any positivity about the world world around me and yet I must and so you know I struggle with this every day and so do you and only by doing that can we really help our clients all right so I'm just now repeating what you read in all the books which is the focus of attachment therapy um, these are you know the targets that you're working with but you may not have thought about number seven positivity as a target in the way that I am. One of the things I like, for example, with a client is I'll um, begin to 
uh, pull out, I'm looking for a book here in my shelf, that um, the positive parenting book. Um, I couldn't find it, but you know, there are many books on positive parenting, but I love the positive parenting book because it changes the whole lens by which you look at parenting. And I have them read it so that they can begin to notice what they didn't get growing up. And to begin to infuse into my thinking more positivity than negativity. Um, and number nine, internal working models. Obviously, I put a lot of energy into internal working models um, and self-awareness. Now, you know, you can read this list and copy it down, but really think about all 10 of these components and spend some time asking yourself, where in my therapeutic model do I focus on these things and how do I work on them? And, you know, what am I aware of? You know, sometimes I, I have therapists who are beginning here and, you know, their therapeutic alliance isn't working and they don't exactly know why. And, you know, I go back to Carl Rogers and all that wonderful stuff that he published. And, you know, of course, all the empirical data shows that he was right about everything. And how do you teach a new therapist about therapeutic alliance? And if you don't have that, nothing else works. We all know that. And so all these components probably take, you know, a course in your training on each of them. Okay, so we identify the, in the intrapersonal, if there is this part of self that is internalized, what we used to call identification with the aggressor, or what in the psychoanalytic is called the introject. And the child embodies their perpetrator. And so the reason they hate themselves is because they find their mother's voice coming out of their mouth. And then they hate themselves because they hate the part of themselves that has embodied the aggressor. This is true for all of us, not some of us. And so as we get to know this angry part of self, this rageful part of self, um, we want to disown it because it's so distasteful. And the reason we hate ourselves is because we act like the people who mistreated us in some way. So the gift that keeps on giving, all of us carry our perpetrator inside of us. And now we've turned the voice against ourselves. And so if we listen to the internal chatter, it is, I feel stupid. I feel ugly. I feel fat. I feel damaged. And none of that's true. It's all brainwashing from our perpetrators that we've now uh, believed as true. So what we feel is true is actually not true. The child will seek to control the caretaker, as we said early. And so what happens then is in their marital relationship, they marry someone who is wonderful and they think is going to change their um, internal working models to believe that they're lovable. But what they do is they recreate in that relationship, the original environment. And so, so much what happens within the couple is a projection of what happens with the self. And if you read Masterson, you know, what he's basically saying is people take their internal battle in civil war inside and they project it on their partner and that's the basis of marital distress. And so really good couples therapy is not interpersonal, it's intrapersonal, meaning that we wasted all of our time talking about what's going on between the two of them when actually good couples therapy is to recognize that what they're doing is projecting their own inside job on the outside and repeating it and reenacting. Now that changes everything about marital therapy. 
you know, I've done marital therapy now 50 years and I have worked with thousands of couples. And, you know, I was trained by the best. I was trained, you know, by uh, people who did social learning theory and Masters and Johnson. And they were, you know, basically couples therapists who were using social learning therapy and teaching people new skills of how to interact and, you know, helping couples change uh, in a variety of ways. And all those people, I memorized their techniques, I've used them for years. And, you know, as Gottman eventually told us, they were necessary and not sufficient. And so, you know, I have completely reoriented my work in marital therapy. And I always work with a couple and I do individual therapy with a partner in the room. And the individual therapy, they'll say, you know, my partner is mean to me. And I look at what that means in terms of what the person is projecting upon the partner and look at what is the origin of their being mean to themselves that they're then projecting on their partner. And so what does that look like? When well, couples therapy, you know, the person will say, you know, we had a fight this week and I was furious because my partner wouldn't um, do the laundry. And instead of teaching them, you know, eye language and all that good kind of stuff only, you know, because they need the skills. What I do is I look for the root and I look for, okay, so you're angry at the person. What's going on with that? You want, you know, at the basis of all couples therapy is you want the person to think and feel and do things the way you do. And guess what? There ain't no other person on earth that thinks or feels or acts like you do. So nobody is going to load the dishwasher the right way. And that sucks, doesn't it? And what are we going to do about that? You know, that's decentralization. That's mentalization. You get it? And so what we have to begin to do in couples therapy is reorient it to seeing these as you know, projections that persons recreate on themselves. So um, what the hell is this thing called earned secure attachment? Those of you who are new to it, um, when you're scoring the adult attachment interview, what you do is you look at the person's transcript and every single word, every single line is studied. And so a person says something like, tell me about my parents growing up uh, and tell me about your relationship with your mother. Give me an adjective to describe your relationship with your mother. And a person says, my mother and I were very close. And you say, okay, so tell me a story about you and your mother being very close. And you say, well, one time when I, I was diagnosed with cancer, she came and she stayed at the hospital for two days. Okay, well, you and your mother were very close because she came to the hospital for two days when you had cancer. Like, what's wrong with that story? Is that coherent? Is that cohesive? Well, let's look at that. Now, that would be a very disorganized state. And so it gives you a clue into other disorganized states. Now, Let's say the person says that my mother and I um, were not very close growing up. And you, then they say, and you know, for a while I moved away from my mother, but as she got older, she became sober. And when she came sober, I was able to tell her how badly she hurt me. And um, those years that I felt abandoned by her. And I was able to express how angry I was for her and how much it screwed me up. And my mother cried and you know, she acknowledged that she uh, had her own trauma in childhood and that she abandoned me. And lately we've become a lot closer. Now, that is earned secure attachment. And the reason is, it's not about what happened in childhood. It's about the way the person has organized that into the consciousness in the present. Now that's really an important concept because what the adult attachment interview taught me was that 
your trauma is not necessarily what happened. It's the way your mind has taken what happened and organized it or disorganized it into your current state. And if you, Mary Main was able to say, by looking at linguistics and the way people talk, it's a window into their mind and to the disorganization of their mind and can be the lens by which we then operate our psychotherapy. Well, holy shit, that's amazing because I never thought of it that way. Mary Main's a genius. And so it was really worth really studying every single line. She would videotape it, each of these adult attachment interviews and you would go through it line by line, beginning to look at the way people use language. And you know, the people who had disorganized attachment on the uh, side of being incredibly uh, anxious attached, you know, their one sentence would be a whole page. And for people who had avoidant attachment, you know, they would give two, two words in answer to the question. And then the disorganized folks would go back and forth and have two lines and then a whole page. And you could just see the craziness of their minds and the way they operate. And it was like a, you know, a window into their disorder. And so suddenly, I would suddenly be listening to my client and listening to their use of language, not necessarily just listening to the words, but the way they use their words and their language as a mirror of their disorganization. And I listened in a very, very different way. Now, I then basically did an autopsy on their dialogue. And what was I looking for? One was how they tended to have a loyal to their family, that if for some reason, they would say things like, my mother and father totally abandoned me, but they did the best they could. Or they would lock me in closets and burn me with cigarettes, but it wasn't so bad. And of course, they all said that. And that last part of it was the key to their disorganized attachment, which is the child part of self had to believe that my parents loved me. And if you take that away, that child feels unloved. The angry part of self, you know, wanted to stab them, the parents. And then the codependent part turned all that into either taking care of others. And so they uh, end up either repeating it with their own children in an abusive way and then hating themselves for that, or, you know, being overly meshed with their kids uh, and screwing them up in that way. So by beginning to look at that lens in all three ways, idealization became a very important focus of my thinking and therapy. Adult attachment interview. Resolution of significant losses in one's life. You know, dealing with losses in one's life is psychotherapy. You know, all psychotherapy is grief psychotherapy. And what is the adversity that you're grieving. And it's not necessarily your grandmother dying. It's something much deeper than that, which is don't love somebody because you're going to lose them. And if you can isolate that adversity and not focus on the grandmother dying, but focus on don't love somebody because you know, you're going to lose them, you're going to then target your therapy so different because then the whole life person's life becomes Groundhog Day, which is one situation of loving that person and then losing them after another, because we recreate our unfinished business. And only by bringing that into consciousness, the correlation of conflict, do we realize that we're creating the very thing that we're trying to avoid. Dick Schwartz once said, um, the truth is that um, when you're afraid of something, it's not so bad. It's realizing that um, it's when you're afraid of something that you tend to recreate it over and over and over again. And that the thing you're afraid of, if you are allow yourself to see it, and know it, um, you begin to break the spell. Let's pick another one. 
metacognitional thinking in relation to family of origin. The little child inside of you says, don't talk that way about my parents. They did the best they could. I love them. They love me. Okay. And you come in and say, but they walked in the closet and burnt with cigarettes. Well, you just destroyed your therapeutic relationship with that injured part of self. So the client goes like this, but they're really feeling this. And so if you understand that you've got three clients in the room and that you're talking to all three of them simultaneously, you see how confusing that can be when you have disorganized attachment. And so only by doing a coherent narrative can you stop hating yourself because you realize you know, the basis of all trauma work, which is that it's not what's wrong with you, it's what happened. And only by recognizing that and making some inner peace with it, that we can begin to love ourselves. And, you know, that's the basis of all good psychotherapy. Okay, so I, you know, you've, you've heard me. I, I, I've always loved Masterson. He wrote this book called The Search of the Real Self. And the reason I read that 20 years ago when it was written is because I had no idea what the hell a real self and a false self was. And so I needed an operational definition. And so I like keeping this in front of me because each one of these, it's like Marshall Liney has create a life worth living. What the fuck does that mean? Excuse my language. And think about it for a minute. A life worth living is liveliness, joy, vigor, excitement, and spontaneity client said to me yesterday, what does it mean when you say passionate? What does passionate mean? And literally, they have no frame of reference of what passionate means. Um, so go through any of these criteria. And um, what, what I would do with a lot of my clients would be, I would be all this work with the eating disorder and be able to help them be able to, you know, have a, a positive relationship with food. But then I'd find that they had learned helplessness and they'd be miserable and unhappy because their capacity for self-activation had been destroyed by the script in childhood, which said, why even try? It never results in any result positive. And so my effort and accomplishments were never there and so I never learned to individuate at age two, four, six, eight, and 10 and learn that I can operate in the world effectively. I am not powerful. Well, what good is it to get under control of the eating disorder if you're powerless and depressed? And so I'm not just interested in the symptom. I'm interested in looking at what the symptom activated in terms of the, the, the deprivation and following it. And now number three becomes important. Get it? Ability to soothe painful feelings. Wow. Can you imagine what it means to soothe painful feelings? You know, my clients, 95% of them, don't know how to do self-care. They don't know how to take care of themselves. And when they leave treatment, what they're able to say to me is, you know, I realize now that we all have problems. Some of them are bigger than others and that I just need to take care of myself. And when things get really tough, I need to do some extra TLC. And here are some of the things that I do in order to be able to do that. And so it's not what they do in this office, it's what they do outside this office. And if on the weekends they go home and sleep all weekend, that ain't therapy. They've got to prove to me that they're doing their work and that they're learning the new skills for self-care. So. They have to learn how to be happy. You know, I took this course at Berkeley on, you know, the roots of happiness. And I think, you know, some huge number of people around the world have watched that on videotape. And it was just so interesting to operationally define what is happiness. Because we as therapists, you know, have not really operationalized how to be happy. And a lot of us are miserable ourselves. And if we can't do it ourselves, how do we expect to help our clients be able to do it? And so learning how to be happy is a skill and it's a verb. And, you know, so any psychotherapy 
once you take away the depression by giving antidepressants, perhaps, we have to do the other side, which is the psychotherapy is teaching people how to be responsible for their own happiness, seeding the development of the real self. You see why I find all these things that I'm giving you as my teachers, and I hope you'll keep them by you in certain ways. Okay, now I run a group every week called Catch Group. We, we have a partial hospitalization here. We see people six hours a day, and we work with people who've been suicidal in the last week or two, you know, and we help them begin to create a life worth living for themselves or person's addiction has been able to be treated effectively outpatient. And the lens I want to show them is my lens, which is working with earned secure attachment. So week one, we are going to deal with family loyalties and idealization. That's I basically um, taken the adult attachment interview and I've taken the components of it and I've done them week by week. Um, and so loving behaviors. What is a loving behavior? What's an example of a loving behavior? And write, you know, five ways that you felt love as a child. And um, most people don't have a clue what was loving behavior. And they don't have a clue how to show loving behavior to their own children because they think of it as instrumental. Instrumental is well, I buy them Nike shoes. I um, make sure that their teacher, you know, doesn't beat them up. All those are instrumental. But loving behavior is you adore your child. And when they walk in the room, they make you happy. And they see their mirror of being adored in your eyes. And they sense it. And they feel special, extraordinary, and love themselves as a result mirror neurons, mirror neurons. And so that's the core. Affect is the basis of loving, not doing, you know, but in a society that is so oriented towards, you know, the only way to make your child happy is to get them to work hard. And that you're, if you love them, you'll teach them how to be able at age five to, you know, be perfectionistic and work harder and teach them that, Whenever you do something, you must do your best. Yeah, that ain't loving. That's an illusion of loving. And it adds burdens and adversities and screws us up. This is an interesting one, involving a role reversal. So many of the people I see are primarily codependent. And they have what I call otherization, meaning that they never are in their own bodies. So the revolution in somatic-based therapies is not just being physically in your body, but to be recognized in a metacognitional way that you have needs, that you have feelings, that you are in your body, that you are mindful, and that as you're mindful, you can see out your eyes and hear out your ears and acknowledge the positive. And you know, I'll say to people, when you walked in today, what did you notice? Were there any flowers as you walked in? And they'll say, I don't know. What color were those flowers? I don't know. Do you like those flowers? I don't know. What flowers? Okay. And, you know, that's a metaphor. They're not really in their bodies. They're not really in their minds. They don't know that they have wants and needs. And, you know, good psychotherapy is getting them back to recognize it. So we have a group this every week on mindfulness, on yoga. But all that stuff is not just what it seems. It's really oriented in a metacognitional way to be able to recognize that they deserve to meet their own needs first as a way of meeting other people's needs, right? Caretaking behaviors, week five. Well, you know, to look at their caretaking in relationships um, and why they need to keep people in dependency relationships. That how they are primary oriented towards controlling others as a way of feeling safe. And what it would mean to be in a marriage, for example, where 
you respected the integrity of your partner instead of feeling like the only way you're safe is if they load the dishwasher your way. To really look at interpersonal behaviors and how destructive their reenactments have been. Week seven, anger. Mary Main called this involving anger. And it's when event triggers feelings and memories from the past, making the problem appear constantly or continually happen. She was always trying to make me into her little doll that would always do what she wanted. She dressed me in that way. And for a while I acted that way, but I'm on to her now. I'm sorry, but I'm not your little baby doll anymore. Quote from an adult attachment interview. And as I said to you, we interject our perpetrator. And so the angry part of self turns the perpetrator's words and you now you do to yourself what has been done to you. And so involving anger is looking at rage and anger, not by learning anger management skills, but by noticing what you do to yourself on a day by day basis. And of course, what we always know, which is, is that the way to control anger is through self-love. But you know, operationalizing what that means, that's week seven. Week eight is what we call passivity. Passivity isn't what it seems to be. Passivity in the adult attachment interview, um, that the speaker appears unable to prevent sounds and phrases from arising while unable to specify its presumed intent or content. And what that means in English is that, um, that if you look at their speech, what they're saying is not really what they're saying. And they don't really know what they're saying. And so if you study their language, what they're conveying um, lacks content. And so we look at aspects of the one's speech pattern and phrases and begin to show them from their vocabulary about uh, their passivity and how the way they organize the world keeps them from being able to feel powerful and in control. Right? Anyway, what I hope you get from this is that it's worth looking at Mary Main's adult attached interview, not that you have to learn to give it or even to score it, but just to study it. And I, I keep the manual really close by. And to look at this because it changes the lens by which you do psychotherapy. And I've operationalized it and I actually do attachment work. You know, most of your outpatient therapists, you say, well, how the hell do you do all this on an outpatient basis? Well, you know, what masters, my teacher taught me was that, you know, at least 50% of, of psychotherapy is educational. And so there has to be some component of information given. And so, I oftentimes take the struggle the person's having and step back and begin to give them education and information or have them watch one of these webinars that I'm giving. And it really helps them begin to um, think of things in a different way. Now, as we think about metacognition, um, the, we always think about trauma as something that was done to them. But you know, neglect is what is the basis of most people's burdens. And therefore, I think it's neglect that is at the real core of so much of what we're seeing is dysfunctional behavior. But most people have not even operationalized what neglect was in their lives. And so what I'm talking about is separation and individuation. Again, back to Margaret Muller. And the absence of separation and individuation and what effects that has on the person. And so now what happens when they get into coupling is they have boundary disturbances. We are a one means we think and feel and act as one. And because they didn't individuate, what they do is they lose themselves in relationship. So while they're single, they can begin to have a sense of self. But as soon as they get in relationship, their boundaries collapse 
and they become dependent on the other person. And therefore, when the other person leaves, they become suicidal. That's not about what it seems. That's an error of separation and individuation. And that's always about neglect. And neglect is sometimes that your mother got her needs met by you rather than you getting your needs met by your mother. And so what you learned, my partner Lori always says, that the way we're loved as a child sets a blueprint of how we know love as an adult. And if the way you knew love as a child was taking care of your sick mom, then the way you're going to love as an adult is by taking care of your sick husband or wife. And so you better make them sick so you can take care of them in some ways. But that ain't love. That's codependency. That's dysfunction. And so most people really don't get what love is. Love it has something to do with respecting the integrity of the individual and not losing yourself in a relationship to, you know, we used to think of in, in St. Louis, they built the arch and they built one side of the arch, they built the other side of the arch and then they connected it. In a healthy relationship, you have an individual, you have another individual and then you connect them. But if you lose the individual when you form the connection, you have a very unsturdy structure. So boundaries is always the core of good psychotherapy. I know you all know. And, but how do you teach boundaries and, uh, in a couple's therapy, when a couple comes in, when they really have you know, individuation areas? And to me, that takes us back to these burdens that I'm talking about today. I ran across this along the way. It's what's called the SELP interview. It's S-E-L-P, not S-E-L-F. But a uh, person who typed this didn't think that was a word. But in the self interview, is has something to do with what you think of me. So what do you think my strengths are? What do you think I'm best known for? What is my biggest complaint? If you would describe me. I always find that what's so interesting about my clients is that I know them better than the person who's lived with them for 10 years after five sessions. And, you know, so... When I'm doing couples therapy, you know, it's like they've lost their curiosity of getting to know their partner and to really listen and hear their partner. And so um, what I'm interested in is this that is with this positive frame, do you know yourself? Does your partner really know you? And what is the lens of relationship in some ways? Um, and so I have people interview one another in this kind of a way. Lori always says to me that I'm a recovering cognitive behavioral therapist, which means that, you know, I always hope that this cognitive behavioral stuff would help a person see the development of the real self, but it doesn't. And so I do this because I think it's necessary, but I don't think it's sufficient. But, you know, the, at the beginning is you've got to know yourself in order to be able to get known by others. Uh, so I never give up on my cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, I also do a lot of work with values clarification. I, I give you sort of this idea of how can you know yourself if you don't know your own values? Um, integrity means that you know what your values are and you operate within the range of your own values. And if you do things that are outside your own value, it's reasonable that you don't like yourself. And so, you know, moral development is to know what adult values are, to know what they are for you and to operate within them. Why do you not have an emotional affair with the person at work? Why would you do that? Because you wouldn't want your partner doing that. So how do you stop yourself from doing that? Well, because by focusing on getting your emotional needs with your partner, that of course takes two people. What if you can't get your partner to be able to do that? Well, that's an important question and there's got to be an answer to it. And so engaging your partner to be able to solve that problem is really important. I'm finding myself getting my emotional needs by done at work. I don't want that. I want to get them made by you. Could we sit down and talk about that, that kind of thing? So 
anyway, I, I like beginning to help people begin to know their own values. So I gave you this value inventory because you know I'm a long lost cognitive behavioral therapist. And I think that some of this stuff is incredibly helpful. I also run a spirituality group. And in spirituality, what I wanna say is, what is your life about? What's important to you? When you die, how do you know you've lived? What is going on for you? And so many people who've given up religion have given up spirituality. And so I've uh, embraced Buddhist philosophies. I love reading Buddhist literature because it enriches my spiritual understanding without religiosity. And so much of the Buddhist literature is teaching people how to live and how to be in life and be able to embrace their values in a positive way and to tilt their in windmills towards mindfulness, meditation, and, and love. And, you know, people say, well, you know, I don't believe in that religion. Well, Buddhism isn't so much a religion to me. It's a spiritual awakening. And any, you know, if people go to a Buddhist group once a week, go to a mindfulness group once a week, um, you know, it's probably the best psychotherapy on earth. I love meditation as a form of psychotherapy. And I find meditation, you know, rigorous brain training to teach people how to be in their own bodies. Now you see there's 41 of these things and more. And so what I'm saying to you is, Values clarification is much more complex than most of us realize because there's a lot of values. And if you want to really know yourself, it's worth studying these and looking at, you know, what are your values and how much of your values are influenced by these burdens that you carry and to challenge these burdens that sometimes that some part of you is persecutory and carrying on the gift that you keep on giving. For example, money. How much does money a value that is about safety? And how much of your life is anxious and fearful around money? And that governs so much of what you think and feel and do on a day by day basis. And the basis for your anxiety disorder is not, quote, anxiety, taking a new anxiety anxiolytic, but beginning to look at the core of this, which is the adversity that you were governed to which was when your parents lost your home growing up, what you learned that got brainwashed in your head that safety has something to do with money and that safety is such a core aspect of feeling safe that you don't feel safe unless you have big bucks in the bank. You know how that works. And, you know, what does that do to destroy your spiritual living? All right. We are at the end of our show here. And I hope um, just to summarize that what I was able to achieve today was a simple statement that therapy is primarily about affect regulation, development of the self and agency. And keep those three things in the back of your mind at all times. That the problem the client presents to you is rarely the problem. And the addiction is only a gift because it tells you what unfinished business from the past is being repeated in the present. And even marital therapy, which I love doing, is wonderful because it's always about a projection of the unfinished internal business. And that when therapists get trained, oftentimes their training forces them to go in the wrong direction. And by going in that wrong direction, they're treating the symptom and not the problem underneath the symptom. And that's why we get so much relapse. And that's why people divorce and so on down the line. That we've been trained inadequately. And when I say we, I'm talking about myself, which is that, you know, after 50 years of doing this work, I can look back on the work that I did. And it was good, but not good enough. And that so much of what I'm, you know, allowing myself to, to learn. So, you know, I still read a book a week. I'm still loving the whole process of evolving as a therapist. And I hope what you get out of today is, is that what I'm saying today is really quite different than what I've said before. And that's good. So, questions? 
Okay, I'm going to start with this one from Lee, and he asked two questions, but I think this one you'll answer everything. I find ACOA could be adjunctive support for client and help train client for daily living and deeper reflection with therapist, bringing 16-year-old, quote, trauma child in with already attentive, quote, loving parent part. Your thoughts? Yeah, yeah, right. This org, you know, I, I was Janice Wojtyk's and all that wonderful work on adult children of alcoholics, all that stuff. I, you know, I, I have my clients read that like all the time, uh, even though they're old stuff, they're, they're still very rich. And, you know, what they were doing is discovering disorganized attachment. These are disorganized states. And what they were saying is that when you watch, you know, Claudia Black, you know, you watch your dad drunk on the floor and you say, what's wrong with dad? And mom says he's just sleeping, but you never saw anybody passed out just sleeping. You learn to disqualify your own sensory was the basis of all ACOA literature. And what could be more disorganized than that, which is that what I have to basically invalidate my own sensory. Now, that is the basis of disorganized attachment. And so what they did was necessary. They laid out what the, was on the person's mind but not sufficient because they never identified how you cure the ACOA, which is beginning to have the development of the real self and operationalize that. Uh, and of course, by going to a group, you begin to see the development of the real self by having other people begin to teach you what they've learned. Next question. Great. If possible, can you share your perspective of how projective identification fits into your discussion today? Which is all I'm talking about is projective identification. You know, that, that's exactly right. You know, that projective identification is taking your unfinished business and projecting it upon your partner in a variety of ways. Uh, and, you know, most of marital problems are projections uh, and they're uh, intrapersonal as opposed to interpersonal. And, you know, so, you know, the, where I learned to do marital therapy the right way was this, Masters. you know, understanding disorders of self is always about projective identification. And, um, you know, all the good marital therapy people did that. And, you know, a lot of the cognitive behavioral therapists missed it, you know, Gottman, who, you know, I use all of Gottman stuff. I love Gottman. You know, I've been to his training, I use this stuff every day, and I find it necessary but not sufficient. You know, and what, what's missing is what we're talking about today. Next one. Do you think deep spiritual self-compassion work can be valuable then to begin to develop self? Yeah, obviously. That um, it's not just what happens in deep spiritual work in terms of ideas and all that good kind of stuff. But we're really changing the brain. And what I mean by that is that when I learned to meditate, I did it for every morning for a half hour. And I, you know, I, I did Zen meditation and I hated it. It was painful. I never would have stayed with it, but my trainer was right there with me. And after about three months, of torturing myself to bring my focus back, my brain suddenly popped down, began to develop new pathways. And for suddenly I could begin to watch my nut, what I was thinking, watch what I was feeling. And I was able to think while I was talking. And all these new neural pathways began to form. It sometimes felt like someone was drilling into my brain. And you know, opening up new pathways is incredible. And, you know, I think we forget that meditation is top down brain training. And uh, you're not going to get that any other way. And so, you know, if I can get my client to do meditation training and have the discipline for that, um, it is, it makes all your psychotherapy much more powerful. And so, spiritual training is brain training and beginning to open up brain pathways and you see the big picture rather than, you know, this, the psychopathology focuses you on, you know, the piece rather than the whole. 
Mark, if possible, please share your thoughts on how these dynamics, especially the quote, control of the other to control disowned aspects of self, unquote, may manifest in couples and possible ways to work with such couples in therapy. Yeah. Um, well, the word, the secret word there is control. All addictions are about control. And the primary addiction is codependency. And we control others because we're terrified of abandonment or terrified of enmeshment. And so, so much of what goes on in relationship, either the avoidant or the preoccupied staff is attempts to control the other around abandonment and enmeshment. And so that's the lens we're gonna look at. And so in order to look at the question, part of it is what I'm trying to offer today, which is a whole lens by which you approach therapy. And so the person comes in and is furious with the person because they are not doing things the way they're supposed to, the right way. And, you know, who made you God? And to begin to look at the individual and where they learned that their safety depended upon control. And there it is, a window into the past. And by beginning to look at their adversity. So the way I do psych psychotherapy is I have a couple come in and I say, what do you wanna work on today? And they'll present it. And when they present that, you know, the woman's angry at the man because I then work with the woman with the man sitting there watching. And we do the next piece of work, which is using their feelings and taking it back to finding the adversity. And we bring into consciousness that which they're reenacting and repeating. and then. At the end of the session, I say to the partner, what did you get out of this? And they'll say, oh my God, I thought it was about me, but it's really about her father, isn't it? And I say, right. And suddenly, instead of his being mad at her, he has new compassion and he gets it. And so he is so cool because he says, oh my God, I thought she hated me and she was trying to control me, but it really is nothing about me, is it? Right. So it's incredible therapy, but it's just a different mode. I, you know, it's a, I like, even when I'm working, if someone comes to me for individual psychotherapy, I'll say, will you bring your partner in? Because I like working with them with a partner in the room because, you know, everything is intra-psych and inter -psych. And by the partner, you know, I always feel like I'm stealing intimacy when I see an individual. But when their partner's in the room, everything that goes on between us also goes on between them. Now, there are exceptions to that rule because as we all know, transference is quite important. And you know, so transference might be important when we're working with a, a primary attachment disorder. But uh, when I can, I do like to add the partner into the therapy. Mark, what do you think about PACT, packed couples therapy? No training in it. Okay, someone asked, what book would you recommend to learn mentalization-based therapy? Oh, uh, that's a tough one. Um, there's a couple books, you can Google it, uh, by the Menninger people, and I've read them and reread them. But, you know, they, they, I just, I, I find some of that stuff too hard for me. So I've been going back to Fonagy, Affect regulation, mentalization, and development of the self. And then I listened to, you know, these days you, you can watch these things on YouTube and listening to Fonagy speak is different than reading his book. His book is really, I mean, I, 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 it takes me hours to read, you know, one page because it's so dense. But when I listen to Fonagy speak, he's the best speaker I think I've ever heard. And so if you, if you can listen to some of his YouTube videos, um, they're, far more useful. So I would, you know, more and more of what I like is looking at YouTube videos and they're kind of a gift because they're free. And so many of these speakers are talking about it. So if you look up mentalization on YouTube, you will hear, you know, the world's greatest speakers, all of them uh, talking about it. And they're so clear. And, um, you know, most of them are out of Menninger or uh, the European uh, version of, of Menninger, which is, um, where Fonagy is. 
Beautiful. Mark, you have one last question. Someone would like to know what, what chair you have. They find it real interesting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it costs 80 bucks, which uh, I predicted like. And uh, it's, a, it's a game chair. But you know, my head, my neck always hurts in therapy. So I need something for my neck. So these game chairs, although they're a little weird, um, are really comfortable. Anyway, thanks for joining in. And uh, I hope some of you will, you know, write me or uh, challenge me. Or if you didn't understand something, ask me because you can see I'm, I'm pretty passionate about this stuff. I've mentioned a lot of different things today and it can be a little overwhelming, but any one of them, you know, are basically lens by which I look at things. And what I'm good at is integrating. You know, I, I, I read and think about uh, lots of different things and I try to put them together and that's my creative gift. So I'd love to tell you more about this stuff. Thank you for coming. Have a great day.